Okay, so we're here for our ongoing discussion of uh, ML Books, The Apocalypse of John, which is his like uh, take on the on all the many symbols that are within the um, and it, the Apocalypse of John and their meaning. And the chapter that we're discussing today is on the fall of Babylon. I just want to quickly go around and and see if anyone has any initial thoughts and impressions they want to share. <clears throat> Um, one of the things I, I liked in this um, is when he kind of backs up and he's dealing with like how, like what the um, kind of the patterns of fulfillment are within um, within the book itself, right? Mm -hmm. um, that was kind of interesting to me because I, I'm kind of jumping into the, these conversations a little late. Right. Um, what, what I really like about his approach is... Uh, that he is managing to um, take some of like the historic and present and future realities of the book in a serious way, right? So he's not like, you kind of kind of break off into three main schools, at least in Protestant interpretations of, of Revelation. You have like the preterist view that puts everything in the past. Right. You have more of an amillennial view, which immunitizes everything as kind of a present thing. And then you have the pre-millennial millennial type views that put everything in the future and they're all right and they're all wrong you know <laughs> and so it is so buck is is dealing with it and, and bulgakov does it in his commentary on revelation as well they're dealing i think with the complexity of how this book relates itself to time how it relates itself symbolically how that manifests in history and i, I think that's like been that's yeah because however really cool. however however it relates to the future or the past it always it, there always is a mode in which it relates to you right now yeah and it is speaking to you and it is relevant to you regardless of uh, of your time or place well and it brought up the thought that like i mean from the vantage point of the the apocalypse itself the text itself this is a, this vision is accomplished it's done Right. But right. it was accomplished beyond time in this heavenly dimension. Right. And so history is kind of as opposed to looking at fulfillment as, you know, prediction fulfillment. It's a filling up. Right. It's like history itself is the fulfillment of this vision. And so it's like until it's completed, it's going to continue to, you know, that those realities continue to pour forth onto the earth. Um and that's kind of the the whole symbolic value of all of you know whether it's the trumpets or the you know the seals or the vials, they're all kind of similar thing is this all pouring itself down onto earth, and we're getting that historical reality that encompasses past, present, and future for us. And I think that like it's definitely um, a refreshing approach to to the book itself. Yeah. Right. You know, you, there's something that you just said there that made me think that made me think of something that's like. Um, uh, uh, Tom Belt said something on, on Twitter like a couple weeks ago about having used to he used to see like Christ is something that happened uh, or that Christ is something that happened to history and now he sees history is happening in Christ. And when you talk, I want to just link that really quick to what you were talking about um, about how this about how this plays out for each of us because Christ is ultimately like the form of humanity. Like he is like where where God and God where God enters into humanity, humanity enters into God. So therefore, that story from Genesis to Revelation always has to be relevant to each of us, and as much we as we participate in that. Well, I th I think that it's it it is that way in the sense that it like Jed Jedediah was saying it was done, but it is being done, and it will be done all at the same time, right? Like this apocalyptic thing is, and I think that that, I think that that's really, really illustrates how fractal everything is. Like, you know, like that, that's, that's the fractal nature of reality, right? Like that's, you know, the part where they talked about the seven hills and Rome and how it could have, you know, that there's been interpretations that he was writing about Rome and so people started following the different emperors of Rome, you know, and trying to locate where they were on that in the, on the line. And and I went when I mean he gets into that later. But um, when I first read that part, I thought, well, yeah, 
it, it was Rome, but it also isn't Rome, right? It's all those things all the time at the same time. Right. I, I, that, I mean, well, I think that kind of like that reading of it being Rome and the seven hills of Rome kind of like as Bach points out, like in, in the chapter, it like ignores like the kind of obvious spiritual symbolism that has always been attached to mountains, right? Mountains are always the place where you go to find God. Yeah, but that 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 harkens back to the whole Whore of Babylon thing. That that's the problem, right? <laughs> that's why we that's why we don't see the layers, right? The, the, the fractal nature of it. Because right. Yeah. That's yes, yes, yes. Keep going. No, that's good. Well, I, I, if you don't mind me jumping in, Sherry, like I, I think that that's exactly when you were, I was thinking the same word when you were saying layers, right? Is that yeah. we, we tend to not, we, we tend in, in Revelation, probably more than any other book in the Bible poses this problem to us is we tend to want to look at like direct correspondence in symbol, symbolic interpretation. Yeah. And the thing is, is that we can't really do that because you're looking at like a densely layered laminate of imagery that has, you know, like a polyvalent sort yeah. of quality to it. It's exactly. not, it's not one of those things that we can just say, well, this symbol means this to the exclusion of that. It's like, these that's are what really I kinda, encompassing. Yeah, that's kind what I kind of don't, that's what I kind of don't like about Jonathan Pajot's approach to symbolism is he has a tendency, even though he'll acknowledge like that symbols are polyvalent, he had the way he presents his ideas, he kind of acts as if like, oh, this is the only possible interpretation of this symbol. This is, it can only mean this, but that's not. But really there are symbol. certain symbols that are, that are fixed, you know, like the mountain, he, he, even Bach says, mm -hmm. the mountain is always an ascent to God, right? That's what it is. It's a, it's, it's, a, it's and it's, yeah. And the ziggurat, like the, the tower is a, is a thing that, that comes from below and reaches up reaches to the above so it's a it's 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 the human beings um construction of a of a way to god you know you could put it that way right that, right without yeah god. And i think that that's where that's where it's like you can you can push a symbol into something it clearly doesn't mean yes but you can't restrict its meaning to like a single fixed point you know, because even within the mountain type concept, like you have, you know, you have that both in its negative and its positive manifestation, right? Like the, the Babylonian ziggurat exactly is what you're, is what you're speaking to. I mean, that's, if you go in and you look at what's happening in Genesis 11, they're building a ziggurat. Those towers were typically, that was where they would use that tower as a kind of a symbol of the primal divine mountain. And they were trying to bring God or the gods down. Well, and ironically, that's what happens, right, in that story. But it's it's the problem of religion and spirituality being built from the ground up versus coming from the heavens down. And that's the that's the big interplay of ascent and descent that's really at play in the whole the whole book of Revelation. Well, is, what's also I think what's also interesting about it is that it's actual it's a material construction. So it it is it represents materialism in its purest form, mm -hmm. right? Like the 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 notion that you could actually build something that would reach. You're talking about Babel now, right? The Tower of Babel. Well, Babel and and Babylon. Yeah, I mean, Bach references it. You know, right. um, I don't know if I should throw this in here yet, but no, go for it. I was when I was reading this, I couldn't help but think of Lilith. Okay, because. There was a point when I was reading Lilith when I when I when I realized and spoiler spoiler alert if nobody's read Lilith but when I realized that she was the whore of Babylon because all of the symbolism that George MacDonald uses is used to describe the, the way that the whore of Babylon is is um, dressed and that she's holding a cup right of abominations in her hand and that she's constricting the waters like and and this is exactly what Lilith does in the story right there's in this she has she's in a city she's adorned with those the pearls are mentioned sapphires are mentioned you know by McDonald she's got a clenched fist and she has restricted all the waters so no she has plenty of water in her castle but all the inhabitants have there's no water running anywhere right 
Um, and I and and it suddenly it dawned on me that as I read further on in the chapter that Babylon and Jerusalem are the same thing. Mm. Right. They're the same thing. They're both your yeah, soul. Yeah, that's that's really interesting, <laughs> Sherry. Like I was thinking, and you kind of get that like the you have the the the, the light manifestation and the dark manifestation of the woman in yeah. Revelation, the whore and you know the woman clothed in the sun in revelation 12 they're playing that's a those are being played they're they're supposed to point us to the fact that that, and he brings that in that in the sense of his uh discussion in the chapter about mother earth kind of have and you see these kind of splitting in these twin daughters of you know which one is going to be the manifestation of mother earth is it going to be the woman you know the heavenly woman of uh revelation 12 or the horror of revelation 18 and 19 or 17 and 18 right, right. and and the, and the the actual um i don't know the jewish story very well of Lil- lilith but i do know that she is the she's the wife of adam right first and, wife of adam yeah yeah first wife of adam and george mcdonald carries that through the, the the book okay so essentially she's the bride of christ <laughs> which is what it's saying Right, because in George's- no, but that's that's right because they're, they're like they're both both the both the horror and and the bride are represent us. Yes, exactly. And it's it's you know, and then and then all the language around destroying, destruction, annihilation. It's it's not descriptive of one thing being punished or killed or whatever destroyed. It's a description of transformation. Yes, that's exactly that's right. What it is. Well, and that's uh, that's you know, exactly that even right, comes in Jerry. with the image of the fire, like the fiery image, the image of fire, and it's kind of the fire of purgation is basically. I mean, that is the lake of fire. If you understand that context, especially if you understand that it's connected to the Arab Dead Sea tradition. Right. And, and that comes out of, uh, especially, I think, Ezekiel 47. Right. The, the well, I mean, even that, temple. I mean, really, honestly, that that image comes straight out of the Zoroastrian tradition. And that's preci- that's precisely what it is in the yeah. Zoroastrian tradition as the lake of fire is like that which purges souls before they can they, they, they can pass on to paradise. Like that's yeah. I don't know anything about that stuff. I, I should read. More yeah. The, so so the the idea in in like Ezekiel is it's using water imagery. But then you see the same imagery in Daniel 7, and that vision is the river of fire. But it's all looking from the throne eastward, right? And if you're in Jerusalem looking eastward, you are looking into the Dead Sea and the Jordan Valley, Mm -hmm. right? And so that's the conceptual framework that John's working with, because this is a throne room vision. So it's corresponding to uh, the earthly Jerusalem. Like, you you don't have to make that too literal, but it's that's kind of the, the spiritual topography of the book. Right. Well, that, and so that lake of fire is is the place where in Ezekiel, the, the the on the new Zion, like in the restored temple, the waters are going to go down from Zion and actually make the dead sea living again. Right. And so the waters of life go and purge the saltiness out of the this this lake. Well, it's that same concept in the same language is being used john's using that imagery for the lake of fire in revelation right even down to like you know the completion of the new jerusalem where the waters near the waters are the tree of life that's right out of ezekiel chapter 47 and so the the purification that's happening that water and fire are doing the same thing they both are purifying yeah. agents right well, and so that's why you get that weird interplay of lake and fire it's because this is something that's this is a purifying thing and a purifying presence in creation that yeah. ultimately by, you know, by the end of the book disappears and all we have is the river of life. Right. Yeah, but we also have the sea of glass. And what's so interesting about that is that you have sand when sand, when you introduce fire to sand, you get, you get glass. Right. And the sand to me is illustrates multiplicity. Like it's just right. And, and, and what happens to the multiplicity like you pick up sand and it just all falls through your hands, right? You, you can't make two of them be together unless they're wet or something, right? Um, but when it becomes a sea of glass, it's fused together, right? And it's also clear, 
<laughs> it's crystal, right? Like, and, it's, it, and that disappears. And that's when it says, and there is no sea. The, it's the sea that is separating the, the sea of separation between, you know, that far shore where the angels and saints are singing. Then you have the elders and then you have the four creatures. Then you have, that's the sea that's disappearing in Revelation. And, I, you know, as someone who's a surfer, like the idea of no ocean in the new creation is <laughs> like, that's a nightmare to me. But, <laughs> but the imagery, the imagery is, 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 is that final distance between God and creation is that gap is gone by the end yeah. of the story. I'm just thinking, well, yeah, right. And I think like C here is like it's being used in like the in its metaphorical register yeah. as potency. And it's like there you can't have potency if everything has been actualized. And what's coming out of the sea in the book, <laughs> it, you know, the, the the beast is coming out of the sea in the book. Right. You know, and so it's like right. there's there's this kind of chaotic element in imagery. It's, it's I'm also I'm also just okay, before I say this, I just wanted to say there is another connection to to the whore of Babylon and Jerusalem and, you know, uh, the bride and Lilith and all that transformation, the, the book of Hosea, <laughs> right? <laughs> and I mean, God uses that language all the time that, that his chosen people, that which he has chosen, right, um, are whoring after other things. He's, he's constantly using that, that kind of language. But the, I mean, Hosea really embodies it, right? Right, right, right. So do you want to get into what you think that means a little bit? Like why that, why that, uh, why that's, why that, why that metaphor, why that symbol? Of, of prostitution? Mm -hmm. um, well, I think it's obvious. I mean, you're selling yourself out to materialism like materialism requires uh a transaction right i think and and i i like the way that bach described the mountains as blocking the view right and that having to having to get up on top of the mountains in order to have that that view of the horizon kind of thing mm -hmm. um Yeah, and then he also described how prostitution started in in religious settings. Right. 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 So it's it's a it's kind of like, yeah, it, what else are you gonna do when your whole world is sensual? Right. Mm -hmm. That's that's kind of the culmination of sensuality. Right. This is what that which reminds me of the like the the part the part of the chapter where he talks about the need to develop uh, an additional sense. Yes. So, um, which is actually tied to the seven mountains because, mm -hmm. like, there's like, um, there's like, the five and then the one and then the one yet to come. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, that's something I want to get into, but I'm I'm also kind of curious because we haven't heard from, from Michael yet. Like, yeah. What, what are your thoughts, man? Yeah, I would be a penny for your thoughts, Michael. I found <clears throat> so I the, I found this idea that there was a, there's a quote in there about that goes into <clears throat> this this concept of the higher and the lower self, and that there, so I'll just read this quote. It says, "It is often said of man that that two souls dwell in his breast." This is True also of mankind as a whole, since the woman in heaven, the higher soul of humanity, bore her son. Man has had the choice between his higher and lower, his lower ego, the free decision between above and below, maturing during the ages of the life of the earth, must lead to a parting of the ways. In the picture of, of the whore, that part of humanity ultimately appears in which the lower soul, earthbound and heavy, has irrigated all power to itself. And that, there was two things in there I found really interesting. But one was the idea of of of, of there, there being this sort of soul that that is corresponds to the whole rather than to the individual, but also this sort of um, this division between the above and below, and that that, that, that there's <clears throat> there's something both for each of us, but also collectively that that sort of uh, precedes us, but also is is sort of um, partnering with what happens, right? Um, 
in this spiritual world. And, and that part of, um, part of our realization is, is, is some sort of uh, return to that or some sort of remembering or um, reconnection with that. And I don't know, uh, that, that just, there seems a real connection point there with, with, um, with sociology as well, because there's this sense in, in, in that um, idea of, of a sort of division that's taken place right, between right. created and uncreated that, that is, needs to be restored. Um, and um, so that, that, that's kind of what captured my, my imagination in this so that, far. That, um, that division, Michael, is I think what McDonald is talking about when he describes that chasm in the imagination essay. The chasm that man cannot cross, but God need not worry about it. Like he, he, he has complete access, right? And, and Bach talks about that, like this, this building from the ground up, right? And then God comes, like everything changes when, um, was it in, in, in Revelation when the, the rider comes on the white horse, right? Mm -hmm that's that's god crossing that like you know you could build you could build all build all the ziggurats you want but it's, it's never going to get you there right but but god can come down and and it's done kind of thing yeah i was wondering I, mentions that. If, you, if you don't mind if i riff on that a little bit michael and sherry like go for um, it yeah because I, I i think like you also what what's interesting is even at a comparative level, some like comparing symbols across cultures. So, you know, using like this, the, this symbol of like the sevens that you see in Revelation, right? Well, I like, I see that, um, you know, mirrored in, in the seven, you know, the six days of creation and the seventh, the Sabbath day, there's, there's a, there's an element that's, that's rooted in that, that's rooted in temple cosmology um, and, and I use some of the similar things within my own meditations uh, using the chakra system, right? And, and that really does give an interesting mapping for the soul because you have the, you know, your lower chakras are lower aspects of soul, right? And then you begin to rise from the heart into the higher chakras so the, and there's seven of them, you know, seven primaries. And they, um, they, are, they speak to that ascent into higher levels of soul where at, you know, at the top level on that crown chakra, everything is united. You almost have like a, a world soul or cosmic soul at that mm -hmm. level. And, and when, when we live, you know, and the goal in those meditations is to have the, that field unified from top to bottom. Right. Right. So you, you're wanting, you're wanting the lower order of the soul and the higher order of the soul, the, the parts of the soul that are more connected to our materiality and the parts of our soul that are more connected to the spiritual world. You want those to function as a single unit, right? And that's kind of, I think, part of what the spiritual life is, as embodied creatures. It's the soul that connects us to the life of the spirit and also connects us to the spirit, to the life of the body. And so having the ability to understand that sometimes those, those desires of our soul that are kind of lower order desires that keep us grounded in the material world, if we can't also transcend that, if we cut ourselves off from the spiritual aspects of the soul and dimensions of the soul, that higher order, then what ends up happening is we, we are missing the top level picture that you know heaven and earth and revelation are meant to come together. They're, you know, it's supposed to come down, they're supposed to meet. And so it's like that meeting point is what I think, you know, Bach is even driving at that in, in the higher and lower orders of the soul. And part of like the kind of the false religion, the whore of Babylon, the two beasts, they all represent this further grounding into materiality. And right. this kind of the spirituality that is in service of kind of the egotistic ends versus like the the different part of the ego is and he even cites the verse is, is galatians 2 20 i have been crucified with christ so it's no longer i who live but christ lives in me the i that is not i is me right and so you the, you have to let go of that lower part of yourself in order to attain to the higher level of the self which is not you as a self-isolated unit but it's you and christ that is the that is the me is christ in me Right. So there's two there. 
and when you're connected to christ he's also that's the cosmic body i mean well it connects you to thing. everything else yeah and so there I mean, you're you're being and, and so i think that 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 lower and if, higher order is really an important concept i mean and i'm just like i mean it's very i mean in, in some ways it's actually i mean it's really simple to to say and hard to do but like it, it's pretty obvious that as long as you're the only identity that you are clinging to is like whatever the self-positing identity that you're trying to claim for yourself is like you couldn't you can't possibly be connected to that greater identity if you're too much grasping on to to that like there's just like it will yeah. it will it will limit you and bind you to that like that's what yeah. you'll be yeah and and it's what's really interesting is how that like horror of babylon type symbol it connects to the religious life right he he makes that connection to the to the priesthood yeah. itself you know it's like the historic protestant move is to say well it's all rome like the roman <laughs> catholic church which is i think uh, misguided but in terms of like just the general critique of the priesthood you see that the, the second beast in revelation is religion gone bad right yeah. that yeah. is what it is and 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 he he says that and i'll i'll, I'll read the quote um couple of quotes that he has uh, on page 151 of the chapter is that the leaders of the religious life themselves become the power which holds mankind back from the spiritual world. Mm -hmm. And then further goes on to say Christian spiritual life was threatened by appealing by an appalling relapse into the principles of Egypt and Babylon, right? Is, is even within the religious life itself is as soon as it becomes a self-referential thing where tradition becomes about tradition, Confessions become about confessions. Uh, right. Creeds become about creeds. Whatever, however we're looking at that and that kind of priestly function where we tend to have that self-referential religion. We right. have to remember that those, that present, that was, you know, we had the political and the religious were both present crucifying Christ. And, and those so are that all, is one of the, one of the elements that puts him on the cross Yeah, and that and we have to resist. Right. And those are all forms of idolatry ultimately too because what what that all what, what all those things have in common they're all things where you have forgotten that your representations are but representations and none of them are the thing itself well this this puts a whole new twist on it's better that a millstone be hung about his neck and be cast into the sea right um i always understood that to be a mercy and some people would be like what you know how how is that and it and it became really clear to me today that because this this talk of annihilation is is and you know being crushed or or destroyed by a, a giant rock a millstone he gave several examples right it's 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 a description of transformation it's it's making making the thing that 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 can't enter the spiritual realm able to. It's a mercy. Well, what right? does a millstone do? It grinds. It grinds what? Wheat. Wheat. Into <laughs> flour with uh, from which we make bread. Bread. Yes. Yeah, and I think that I think that you know, like the at, at a spiritual level, I think that the question that the that these chapters in Bach and in, in the apocalypse in general are putting the question to us because we see these dualities and, and box says like the battle with the horror is not one that doesn't touch all of us right we're all right. touched by that battle like and the we all are the, the horror the pull to oh, we're touched the by it we're touched by it <laughs> yeah but it's, it's the question is how how difficult are you going to make your own path toward transformation Right, right right is it is it is that's the, right. does like, the lake of fire become the necessity does the lake of fire become necessary does the millstone become necessary does the destruction and the annihilation become necessary for you to finally emerge into the spiritual life or will you engage the struggle in such a way that yeah you are going to battle with those realities that, that duality right, that's, we battle is, with it in ourselves but, but this is why at least this engage is, the struggle you're better right, off this is why in spite of the in, in spite of like the suffering that is involved this is why christ can say that my yoke is easy and my burden is light because the alternative is <laughs> the millstone 
the fire, uh, the purgation. I mean, it's it's like it actually is the easier path, <laughs> ultimately. Yeah, you know, like I, I'm not sure if this is what you're getting at, did or die, but I don't like to think about these things in terms of something we can do. It's like, okay, now I know. I, I, you know, I, I'm not going to give in right, to the more yeah. about. I'm going <laughs> to do this <laughs> instead, you know, <laughs> because Lilith has something in her hand and she doesn't even know what it is and she can't let go of it. But that's such a perfect that. image too, though, right? Because that's like, because that's like, like I've, I've used the image before too of like in one of our conversations with, with Luke, I was talking about like, you know, of us being like a, like, 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 like a monkey if it has its hand like caught in a trap because it's holding on to like something shiny it doesn't want to let go of. And it's like, there's a, there's, there's a, there's a juicy mango like right above its head that it can't see because it's so fixated on, you know, that shiny object that's clutched in its hand. And it's just, it's a matter of just letting go to free yourself from a trap, but that's, not easy to do well and, and sherry i i think i think like it's kind of the, the the idea that comes to mind to me is like damned if you do damned if you don't yeah. right you are going to have to face the fire one way or the other right yeah and the and i'm not saying like that in a final sense but it's just that that no there there is a sense where we are incapable of any of this absolutely yeah. true That's and right. what is equally true is our response matters, right? Yeah. Our, I think our, it's our, just you know, so putting yourself in a position where you can, you know, like uh, I had one pastor that had told me something about, you know, I was talking about the spiritual life. And he says, if you want to get hit by a train, the best place to be is on the tracks. You know, he said, so if you're if you're looking to like experience the the benefits of the spiritual life, you got to put yourself on the tracks where at least that can take place. It doesn't make it less of a struggle, it doesn't make it you know, doesn't, doesn't remove you from the battle or from your own ineptitude <laughs> and, Michael, and for divine you, grace. Looks like you have something to say. Did you... Well, I, I'm just this idea it, I'm kind of, I'm <clears throat> apologies. I'm, I'm kind of still stuck on this, this idea of the two selves because I just found it so endlessly fa fascinating, but one aspect of this transformation and, and some of the difficulty we have in recognizing it is is, is sort of difficulty in recognizing that it's actually something that we really want. Right. Yeah. And, and that it's actually, and so I've been reading through um, <clears throat> this, this DC Schindler book and, and he gets to some really interesting metaphysical conclusions starting, you know, with this kind of basic anthropology about what man is um, by the end. And, and one of those things it is, I feel like it is related to this idea of the higher self in a certain sense, there's, the part of us that that wants this already pre-exists us in some sense and i think that is kind of this That's higher right. self and it's it's like so in a certain sense and this sounds it's kind your, of it's woo, your guardian angel michael yeah it, it we have to in some sense I, when, it, when we talk about getting stuck at this sort of threshold between the physical and the spiritual it's 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 a sort of recognition of the causal power this sort of divine element of us to, 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 to author and not only change ourselves, but also like this, this, hum, this, whatever this cosmic, you know, soul of humanity is that we have some authorship capabilities of that, that are already present in us. It, but it, as soon as we kind of come to recognize them. And, and so there's, you know, Sherry was talking on the box earlier today about being in the, in the world and not of the world. And it's, it's something of this, uh, I don't know. It, it's something, it's something about the, the union of these two selves that, that kind of makes that possible. I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I think that the, um, that, uh, you know, in um, Eliot's poem in four quartets, I think it's in little getting four. I want to say the almost the conclusion where he he talks about um, this fiery dove that descends the dove descends and breaks the air filled with incandescent terror, uh, and and it's like this this fiery manifestation of the spirit and we have we have one two choices in front of us to be consumed by the fire or to be consumed by the fire, right? <laughs> and so you you have and that's like our only hope and it's our only despair and and this this idea of like that fiery transformation like that is 
I think that that the the one thing that is the distinguishing factor between whether you are manifesting as the whore of Babylon or the woman clothed in the heavens, right, is the disposition of the heart, right? And that's always a split factor. We always have mixed realities in our heart, but like, you know, and I think people who are so locked in the, their materiality in that lower self that they they don't even recognize the battle within themselves and they're trapped in the in the material des the desires for the things of this world right it's not that the things of this world are in and of themselves even necessarily evil but we fall into evil in our pursuit of them because we're so locked within this is our only reality but if you're at least beginning to say that there is a higher order of reality present in the world maybe hidden but still present and that that is the true source of my life and the true source of even my enjoyment of the things in this world. It changes our relationship to materiality, right? Where you have a kind of a spiritual materialism or a total materialism, right? right. And, and I think that we're, we're being called into that, that place where we have that, that unity between the, the two selves, the two aspects of the soul to where we're not, you know, I don't think that we're, you know, the Christian life is always an embodied life. So that bodiedness is good. But if we're living solely for the body, then we, we fall into all kinds of things. And that's, a, that's the Christian struggle. And I think, you know, Bach is very realistic about that in this chapter is like, this is the struggle that we all fight. Right. And yeah, so yeah. we're going to fight that we're, we're going to have times where we lose particular battles in that. But then but is where, where's the trajectory? Is it, you know, are we fighting or not? If you're not fighting it, then you're kind of, then you got the millstones and the lake of fire is your salvation, right? But if you are fighting it's, that fight, then it, you're, you're, you're ready, you're more ready to join in that resurrected life. And you're being prepared for that in this earthly existence. I keep wanting to say that we have to stop talking about the millstone and the fire as if they were a bad thing. Like we need to start thinking about these things as a mercy. Yeah, because they're, graces. they're just severe. Good. The more yeah. severe, the more stuff comes off. <laughs> <laughs> That's the way I look at it. <laughs> right. But it would be better or not. But it's but it would be better or not to you know you know you know what I'm saying. I mean, like yeah, I agree with you. Yes, I don't, I don't this... think so. Actually, see, this is the thing that I'm. That this is okay. The thing that I don't think so because we we're all in need of of purification, right? Um, like you know, I was thinking when we were talking about the sea of glass. I was thinking, I wonder if that's what because Bog makes a reference to the Samaritan woman, right? Yes. And the and the, and the five hills and and you know all that stuff, and. And I thought, I wonder if him walking on the water was a reference to the Crystal Sea with Peter, right? Oh, that's that's interesting. Yeah, that's really because that's how yeah. it because well that that's really I like that a lot because that suggests that suggests that that Christ is is interacting with. He's reality already, as it actually is in an eternity right so for him yes, like the that, sea is a solid thing that he can walk upon with ease right and like peter at first is like able to for a moment before he starts thinking to to see that but, right but so, where does christ go after all that like he you know he has these moments of like you know stilling the storm feeding the five thousand, walking on the water and then where does he go after that to the cross right 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 to the cross well you, it, the, the image is like i mean that image is like really dense sherry because like you if you want to take the walking on the water image you're you're walking on the the surface tension the liminal aspect between the higher and the lower right? yeah i know and yeah. peter can navigate those waters so long as his eyes are fixed on jesus but he plunges right. below when he takes his eyes off of Jesus, you know, and, and that's where Jesus is gentle. And, he, you know, just a little bit of faith, Peter, that's all you need. Just keep, keep right. your eyes on me and you can walk on water, you know, and we can, yeah, we can maintain our, we can maintain that surface tension, that liminality that is the spiritual life, yeah. but that takes the eyes of faith to be able to navigate that. Right. And it's also, I think it's an inversion, 
But I wonder if it is it really just the spirit is it really only the spiritual life though or is it actually like is there something like I think it's more than just spiritual life too. Maybe. Well, I think like, it's the I'm whole of the say, whole anyway. of our reality is it, like you, if you want to like really branch that out it's the it's the mode of existence is a liminal space. And so being able to exist in that tension however you want to construe it spiritual life or you know, life in the world, whatever it is. Like, I mean, I think there's a sense where like we're called to walk on water that is as a that's like the the normal course of our existence. Like if you want to push that parable far enough, I, I think you you know push that as a parable. Yeah, I, I do I do want to and I and I've pushed it there before too. Like what uh specifically because like that incident like right after that incident is like where um like that incident happened shortly after like uh, uh the feeding with the loaves and the fishes and then mm -hmm. right after that like jesus like laments in the boat that the apostles didn't understand about the loaves and the fishes so you have these these two like these two signs of like infinity somehow like expressing itself in it in, in, in a finite human being right by like the miracle of the of, of the loaves and the fishes and the walking upon the water and it's like jesus is like upset by the fact that the that his disciples just didn't get it so like there's so i i don't think to me that suggests that it's something more than just like a spiritual reality that they're not seeing like that there's something else there and i think like something michael said kind of made me think about that too but i'm not i'm not quite sure i don't have the pieces to well, do you mind if we go enough. back to um oh uh, sure i don't want to cut you off if you had something else you wanted to say there so i was just going to say jesus describes them as uh, as having little faith right. and Bob references this too when he says if you had the faith of a mustard seed you could move a mountain right right and i've always wondered about that verse because i don't think that jesus is taunting us he's not saying yeah you, you know and I've seen people yeah, try to. I think he's just saying, up. have just a little bit, just have a little bit. I don't think yeah. you know, Jesus well, is like, actually, oh, ye of little faith is like, I don't think he's trying to like blister the. I think he's just trying to say, just a little bit, guys. That's all well, you need. See, this is the thing. I, I, I reject that too, because that's, that is something that you would have to build. Okay. But you, Sherry, yeah. there's yeah. always a response. There's always response. There, like you're not, it's not about building. Just, it's about it's about receiving what is already real. Let it's me about just, aligning actually, to reality. Go ahead, me, go ahead, Sherry. Let me just finish my thought, okay? Because that I didn't finish my thought. So I think that what it just what it's showing is that that reality is it's inverted, okay? Um, what Pete, what happens to Peter? It's only because Peter is sunk in materialism, okay? What happens to Jesus on the water is that's reality. And, 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 and you can only walk on that water right. when, you, when you have set your sights on the That's what that I was, field, that, that, okay? that, that, is re, that, that, that is reality was kind of what I, that's why I wanted to get out of this. Like, let's just talk about it. Like, it's not just, it's not just being spiritual reality. It's like, no, that is reality. Like, that is reality. The, the material. Like, right, but, 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 the, the, but, 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 but there, here's where I would, <laughs> I would cut in here. Like, we have to be realistic. Living in that reality is not easy. Like we don't, we don't get into that from like that. Peter's response is natural. That's, no. And I think, right. And so and like I, the, 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 the side of it of, well, yeah, of course that's reality, no but that's not the way no judgment about it at all. Like yeah. saying what I said, doesn't, doesn't assign any kind of judgment to any, anything. Okay. Gotcha. All gotcha. I'm saying yeah. is, <laughs> all I'm saying is it, it's Christ is inverting. He's showing us what we don't see. Okay. Mm -hmm. This is this is okay. what we you need to see. This is what you don't see. This is reality, right? And that's why he can be compassionate to Peter when he falls in the water because of course he can't see. Right. And I think that the yeah. like the healing of the blind man of, you know, I believe help my unbelief. I think that those are like those are the that's the normal response for for us and I think that's 
one of the beautiful reasons why that's in in our gospels is well, <laughs> this, is that, this is that thing that jess and i talked about you know how job job lands at unknowing right he lands at this position of unknowing but he he finds peace in knowing where he belongs but he also knows that his redeemer lives right he, you know, he, there's a lot he doesn't know, and there's, there's something him, he does know. God shows him the big picture and and basically tells him, you're never going to figure it out, right? It's too big, but you belong here too. You have a purpose, and that's enough for Job. He doesn't have to know, right? He doesn't have to understand why the ostrich does this, why why there is a Leviathan, why there is a BMS, you know, well, I would he say that, understand any of it. He just, I think that, where he well, is. yeah, I would say that Job has faith like the, like the mustard seed and it's not, it's not faith the size of a mustard seed. It's faith like a mustard seed. Well, what is the faith that the mustard seed has? The mustard seed knows that it goes into that, that it goes into the ground and that it is transformed and becomes a tree. Yeah, it's limitless capacity, but you have to die. It doesn't to resist. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So the mustard, the faith, like a mustard seed, is the faith that doesn't resist its own transformation, which involves death, like <laughs> going yeah, into the that's, ground. That's the nasty <laughs> little secret. In, right. In, in, exactly. And that's why we know. want it and don't want it at the same time. Which is right. why we, which is why we long for the, we, we long for you know the Messiah to come. And yet we want, yeah, you can wait a little bit longer. He doesn't have to come right now. <laughs> so, because that's the, that's the threshold that no one wants to cross. Well, and yeah, and that's where we, and, and that's where Jesus, and I think Sherry had said something about this earlier, um, you know, about him going to the cross. And Jesus is saying, like, you got to pick that thing up every day. Like, you have to bear that cross. Like, right. you have to bear, like, that's the, that's the, that's the way. Right. You, well, you, it it, it realters your relationship with death is like you, as opposed to fearing it, you have entered into a relationship where you're taking it up on yourself every day. And that's well, and then maybe hopefully one day you get to be like Ignatius and say, please don't hinder me from living. Right. Right. Dying. But that's not that's not the worldly <laughs> way. The world, the material right. way is to preserve that materiality at all costs. That's right. an inversion of what we would consider. Right. So I would say that right. Sherry, this is the al so this is the alternative. Like so, it's either the it's either the lake of fire or the millstone, or the lake of fire and the millstone. <laughs> or no, no. Well, modify that a little bit. Is baptism right? The one yeah. who baptizes with yeah. fire, right? You're gonna get. You're gonna. The fire's coming. It's like what? What's your? What's your? At the end of the day, I mean, I think we're all speaking in that universalist register of this is yeah. all redemptive, right? Yes. But I do think like there, we shouldn't take a um, we shouldn't take a passive role to that fire, right? Taking being active, actively inviting that fire within our lives now is a good thing, right? Because it it spares us from certain measures of judgments that weren't designed for us anyway we were just well, supposed to feel that fire think, here i think that just needs a, a certain amount of awareness honestly like if you think that the fire is waiting for you yeah right? as opposed to it's here now if, yeah right yeah. so when you realize like this was one of the things i realized when when um i i understood the reconciliation of all things that 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 this fire is is constantly going to be making me better. It's you know, and then I could see it working, right? And yeah. and I could I could move into holiness in a more aware way, you know. Whereas before I was just kind of going, oh, okay, so do I do that or do I, you know, I don't know. That's going to work out in the end. Because <laughs> yeah, everything well, that's... geared towards the end. Well, and Sherry, what's interesting about that is that's what makes like your connection with Lilith and the whore. So like, because in both cases, you begin to look at them in a much more sympathetic light. Yes. Right. Right. Like they're not. And, and I think that that's kind of in, in the Christian world. Like we, we, uh, we see the, the pure woman mm -hmm. and the dark lady, you know, if you want to use like Shakespeare's type stuff, right. In some of his sonnets with the dark lady. Right. Um, like we tend to look at her as this wicked, vile thing, as opposed to 
you know, something that's emblematic of something within us, right? As opposed to like, this is how we should be women or, you know, the pure woman, the, the, the poorish woman. It's like, well, no, that's inside of us. Those are realities inside of us. And the sympathetic thing, the kindest thing that can happen to Lilith is for her to face the judgment. The kindest thing that can happen for us is to face the judgment. It's not, and, but we, and, and also I think the, have I that think higher the, side I think of ourselves Hosea, that's already the Hosea connection that Sherry gave us like really ties that together too. very, yeah. I think that really justifies that reading of the symbols. So there's a quote out of Lilith that, because, okay, so we've got, we've got the, what is it? The, the uh, ossification of language, right? This is, I think the biggest hurdle for Christianity is it because we talk about lakes of fire. We talk about brimstone. We talk about, annihilation we talk about evil we talk you know and we've got so much baggage around these these words right right and and we need to resurrect our vocabulary is basically i think you know right. it needs a new body right well that's what it means for the, the when, when people say that the church needs to die and be reborn that's what that means right and and so mcdonald says um this is a quote out of lilith uh, someone asked adam about the wound and um, on Lilith, and he says, nothing will ever close that wound, he answered with a sigh. It must eat into her heart. Annihilation itself is no death to evil. Only good where evil was is evil dead. An evil thing must live with its evil until it chooses to be good. That alone is the slaying of evil. Right. Now, how, like, I never thought like that before, to be honest. Right, right. I never thought like that before. I didn't, I thought evil would be destroyed, like with an atomic bomb that, you know, there'd be a giant mushroom cloud and gone. But no, evil is destroyed when it's replaced with good. Right. And, and, and what, and what, I mean, like, like the reason that that has to be the case is that if, if annihilation were, were all that was required, I mean, a, a, annihilation would 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 represent that God made an error that God made a mistake right and it's well, just like oh I just have to yeah. I just I I made a mistake and I just have to get rid of all this stuff that went wrong right right and you know like I the annihilationists are right those people will disappear but they won't <laughs> they won't be gone <laughs> It's right, like, exactly. Right? They'll be the transformed. Whore of Babylon is annihilated, but she doesn't go right. away. She's so, with the bride. Well, it's like uh it's like uh you know, it's like when when a caterpillar transforms into a butterfly. It's like the the I mean, the caterpillar caterpillar didn't I mean, the caterpillar ceased to exist, but it still exists. It just exists now as a butterfly. Right. Like Babylon sinks down, right? It's it 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 dies into itself, into its own materialism, and Jerusalem comes down from above. That's the replacement, that that's the transformation, right? Right. And and when you understand that both are representative of of our soul, and I mean, not just that. I mean, the, it's it's a symbol that's working on multiple layers and it has yes. other meanings beyond that but one layer of its meaning is it's a symbol of our soul both are mm -hmm. both the both 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 the woman clothed in the sun and and the whore represent our soul to some to to a certain extent and also the soul of the world too right the world soul as like the fallen the fallen world versus versus the the the, the world soul as sophia um, that was with God in the creation. Like, th th so th th all of those things are going on in the same at the same time. Um, so. well, and I think that that's like the the kind of the provisional dualism that is present in Revelation, right? Is right. Is, this all does culminate in the New Jerusalem, where there is difference. The, the the foundation stones are different than the gates of pearl are different than the city that streets are paved with gold there's difference in multiplicity in that city but there but there's no darkness so that there's there's not that aggravated relationship between light and darkness any longer it's difference but expressed totally in unity but now we experience different on a different plane right where there's this aggravation where there is the duality between the two ladies the duality between the two cities but that doesn't 
it, like it doesn't it's not the erasure of difference all those elements will still be there the right the whore becomes the bride a non-duality that, that contains the duality and, and unity that contains a multiplicity yeah the the kind of that that difference between like the archonic and the iconic that we've talked about in the past of like the difference between a zero-sum dualism and a non-zero-sum and a complementary you know the masculine and feminine are are complements right the light well, and dark like when, you, when you see the dualism like that you're peter falling in 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 the sea right right mm. as opposed to the expression of unity yeah it, and, you know and, and, and it's, it's like that's the that difference unity that jesus can walk on the water mm -hmm. right? that's what it is you fall into the dualism right you sink michael it looks like you were trying to say something it, it, it seems to me there's Broadly speaking, there's two two issues we're struggling with, um, and I, I don't know to what extent these are these are new or modern or whether they're because <clears throat> there's resonance in in the scriptural text that that you guys are referencing as well. Where one of the things that we seem to struggle with is a feeling that where our agency is is most operative and where or even where the only place it exists is in this sort of earthly realm. That that's where where I have the choice to do this or that. And, and that's where, you know, like to, to pick up this phone or do this thing like that in the material world is where that's where the chessboard available to me is right. That's, that's where I can operate and do stuff. And, and, and if I want the world to be different, I need to do different stuff on that chessboard. And so that's one we think, we think of the, the lower as primary in some sense it's it's just and maybe that's a new thing but maybe it's actually it's been going on for a while probably you know maybe we're, we're getting to some extreme version of it in terms of our of how we are you know our culture and the the ontology or lack thereof um kind of forces us into that and and then also we see you know if we are you know quote unquote religiously minded people we do have this conception of the spiritual world, but we do, we see it as radically distinct. Like we're caught, even if we, I mean, I don't know if this is true for everybody else, even if I propose and see intellectually a compelling reason why those two worlds are actually uh, kind of interlaced with one another and actually are the same thing to, to a larger extent, more than they are distinct, you know, um, I still kind of experience them as kind of distant realities from one another. And I think it seems to me like, again I, I i don't know how to explain this i don't have a good language but it's it's like an, un, coming to an understanding that where we're where we are primarily operating is in that spiritual world that, that where yeah. we are making choices in what we are coming into union with or fighting against or all those things it's primarily happening there um and in that in some sense it, it, all these difficulties in some sense that we're coming up in, in some real sense, we've chosen the particular difficulties. It was like a prior, higher version of us that chose, yes, this is the path I will go. And, and coming to, oh. to some sort of understanding of that such that we, and, and, and it's in a certain sense, it's, it, it is myself, but it's also God. It's, it's, it's the providence of God also with mm -hmm. my unique agency in partnering with God such that before the existence of me that caused me to be. Have you, uh, Michael, that reminds me of, uh, have you ever heard uh, uh, Rabbi Manus Friedman's take on the Garden of Eden story? Uh-uh. Okay. So for, like Manus Friedman's uh, interpretation of the Garden of Eden story, it's like, like essentially like Adam and Eve are heroic volunteers in his version of the garden of eden story like that like they choose to descend into this lowest reality in order to participate in the process of of tikkun alam so um, yeah yeah I, and, no, so, and what you oh, were saying ahead, really resonated with that yeah that and I, I think i think that like that's where i was i was thinking about just uh, michael what you, what you were saying with respect to a kind of pre-existence right to where like i remember i was got a chuckle out of something i was reading in Berdaya where he's like duh we have pre-existence kind of thing it was just like it should be the most obvious thing that like our spiritual existence in some sense transcends time and that there was some kind of agreement to come into this drama yeah. well, and i think like the same that, idea 
that well, yeah, I mean, oh, yeah for sure slain, slain before the foundation of the world right so well, yeah and, well, and David, I, that's and that's the David point though sherry and that is the big point is exactly what you said right at at the midpoint is we chose to exist in a world where god would manifest right. himself on a cross and yeah. let's not forget and like christ is the form of humanity right so in so the lamb slain before, before we we are part of that we have to be because christ shares our humanity so the, and and it like animals represent human beings in that sort of symbolic language so you it the lamb is a human by virtue of being an, represented as an animal so we're there like yes. we are part of that we participate yeah, and i think in that it. that's like the that's the that's the side of the story that we it, it makes me think of like the tolkien's themes of music in the silmarillion right mm -hmm. the, the the creation song itself right is at some point melkor comes in and starts singing a different tune right and and you know but the the last part of that theme is god standing up and saying even the stuff that you even all the discords that you are putting into the music is getting woven into a higher melody and to deeper harmonies. And I think like for us, that was the terrible theme, the terrible and wonderful theme that was proposed to us was like God showing us, Hey, let me show you what, what in this spiritual dimension you cannot know and that you can only learn in time is how I really am and how I really am and how you really are all centers on that cross. It all well, meets and converges at that point. That is the foundation of the world. That is creation. The cross, the world yeah. is created at the cross. The, yeah. It is the foundation of the world. Yeah. It, it, and, and that's the, and, and that is the, the foundation in time that echoes throughout eternity. Which is what, which is, is what Tom, story. which is what Tom was referencing when he talked about like history happening in Christ. Yeah. So you'd be surprised, Nate, to know that in a Q, recent Q and age, um, Jonathan Pajot said, was answering a question about something. I don't remember the question. But he said, well, this might sound really strange, but we were present at creation. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, Pajot and I, and I agree on a lot more <laughs> than we disagree about. I'm not, I don't, I just like, the disagreements are really petty and mostly not a, pro a product of cultural differences, I think. Anyway, I just had to throw that in there for your information. <laughs> no, that's fair. I don't, I, I, I love, I, I like Pajot. I watch Pajot. I like Pajot. <laughs> <laughs> i am i'm a reconciler you know no yeah absolutely yeah i just i say hey i would just say to him hey Pacho, you like maximus you should, you'll really like bulgakov read more of him yeah, well, you know <laughs> oh, I, didn't, that, didn't that guy reference origin yeah he did in that conversation with Pacho, he referenced mm -hmm. origin which is a little not so orthodox well, is it, is it well i mean if you if you're oh, reading john just... bear though john john bear has recovered like i mean i don't know this is recovered. orthodox priest yeah and and, yeah. I, and that's where it's like I, with my orthodox friends who are kind of anti-originist i i just want to tell them go read john bear's introduction yeah, yeah, to yeah. on yeah. first principles like yeah. it's going to clear up a lot of i mean it, the origin system was totally perfect i mean maximus really is correcting certain elements of of origin in terms of how he's construing right. that pre-existent story but um you, you know origin is the idea that he's not somehow orthodox to me is just it's laughable you know because he you don't have orthodoxy in a sense until you have origin well um, i mean and also i mean it's like i mean pre-existence it's like okay um there's a there's a there's a part of you that is by definition eternal like like god breathes into adam's nostrils god's breath mm -hmm. well what is that your spirit is eternal like a, how could you not have pre-existed like that part of you well and that goes to the to like michael's other point as far as I, like when he was when you were talking michael i just the the terms that came into mind and i'm really been and you know, thanks to Nate, have been reading a lot of Margaret Barker's work, but the idea of the hidden and the manifest, right? Mm -hmm. If you're looking at reality solely within its manifestation and, it, and its yeah. appearance, um, as opposed to the hidden reality of the Holy of Holies that is the whole reality, right? The, the hidden reality of the presence of God is the source of life of the world. But in order to enter into that, you have to go through the veil, which is to die. 
And so you're having to embrace that, that reality of death in the process of living itself. And, and then that opens you up to the invisible world that is the world. Yeah, and there's a connection, the but, right? And there's also a connection between the Holy of Holies and the coincidence of opposites, because, like, the Holy of Holies was a place like inside the Holy of Holies, like the normal like law, the normal normal Jewish laws about separating things, like didn't apply in the Holy of Holies. Like, so the the veil is actually made of linen and wool, right? Not normally and then, mixed. within it. You have like a, that's day one. Is the is the Holy of Holies is 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 where light and darkness are eternally present, but then they're also, you have right. unity and you have division, right? And so everything is existing as one, but there's unity and multiplicity. But when you get further outside of the Holy of Holies, that multiplicity, if you don't understand the unity principle, binding it all together, you get lost in the multiplicity, you lose the unity. Right. And, and so it's that, that in the spiritual life is the, is not the escape from our materiality or anything of the sort is it is being able to integrate the hidden and the manifest and hold those two principles together at the same time. You and know, I think like, ultimately it has to go through our materiality too, which is why I don't like, which is why I don't really go in much for like, you know, extreme asceticism, for example, I just don't think that's. Yeah. Like what, what Hart would call it is like pious nonsense right yeah, yeah. <laughs> like you, you can yeah. you can sound really pious, pious and holy but there's there's no breath right. in that kind of in that kind of uh well because you're not actually you're not you're, you're not learning to be in the world but not of the world yeah you're if not you follow engaging. that you're right exactly you're just like you're just trying to escape from the world entirely you're, you're not actually you're not actually being in the world so and I think it has to do with this this idea of like the the, the clenched fist, like uh, that, that Sherry's talking about, and like Lilith and the clenched fist, and like you're holding on to something you don't even know what it is you're holding on to, and it's like you're just holding on for dear life, and you and you and you, and you don't like that's 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 like that is living in the world and being of the world, like not being well, but but there's a place that you can be where you can let go of let go op open up your hand and, and and you can still be in the world but not of the world it's like learning to use without possession well and that's where the virtues themselves can trip us up right because a false virtue is just the vice in its inverted form right and so pursuing the virtuous life outside of the actual struggle of being in the world to try to escape materiality in a sense, as opposed to have an integrated reality that says that right. the material and the spiritual are together, because the, the point of action is where our feet is still where our feet hit the ground. There's a, there's an image that Bach has in one of the earlier chapters before you joined us in these discussions where like like Bach talks about Christ is actually like standing in between to 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 kind of like opposite like poles of evil right so like the the crisis actually occupies the center place in between like this aramonic pole and this luciferian pole of evil um and the luciferian uh register of evil is kind of like associated with like that sort of like <sighs> like self-righteous hyper spirituality like enlightenment for the sake of enlightenment like it's it it's it it's it, it is a false spirituality right so it is it, it's and and the aramonic is just the purely material well christ is actually found in between those two right right well and the ascetic can like i mean i i hate to use such a stark terminology but like the ascetic that disintegrates the connection between the spiritual and the material so any kind of like flight from the world kind of asceticism is is a false eroticism as well the false eros it's like spiritual masturbation essentially it's not the productive life on the ground where we are in we're engaged in the life of the world and we have to and so to be in order to take like the in that verdaya sense of the creative call the divine eros that is motivating the, the the creative life force we we go for something else that is more that leaves us more self-satisfied and leaves us more you know self-assured and jesus is actually harder on that mode of evil right the the kind of the religiosity of right yes. false virtue 
than he's he harder is on that on, than anything. Like the one on time, me. the one time he loses, <laughs> he loses his school. Apparently, it, it is is in the cleansing of the temple. Yeah, you know, we're like that's well, and he like, calls the the, scri the scribes, you know, and the spiritual leaders of his time is you know whitewashed tombs, vipers. I mean, he's he's not he's not you know he's not mincing words with just how dangerous that kind of spiritual life can be. And and and, and specifically, what it seems what like there's a specific thing that he is he's calling them out for, and that is like limiting access. Right. Like that's what like it's limiting access. Like the money changers are limiting access based on you know material, uh, material wealth, and the the scribes and the Pharisees are 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 limiting access legalistically. Right, and, and that's the back to box, the core of the thing. It's back to exactly what Box says about the leaders of religious life themselves become the power which holds mankind back from the spiritual world. That is when spirituality religion becomes the whore right yeah but it the horror appears everywhere the horror oh yeah for sure yeah i mean it yeah. manifests economically it manifests politically it manifests socially it manifests religiously it's, it's a, because it's our yeah. it's, it's our systems that we have created and it is also us internally within our own soul and it's like so of course it touches everything yeah and i think for those of us that are more inclined to the religious life though that is, that is something we have to be really watchful of is like yeah i think that the the call to holiness and wholesomeness and and purity and goodness and you know the fruits of the spirit is real but gosh that is a really fine right. that's walking on water again sherry right because the answer the answer isn't the answer isn't <laughs> like the answer isn't like oh don't have any communities at all right that's not or, that's not the answer. Or don't it's, be human at all. Right. <laughs> right. Exactly. I think so. most monastic communities are pretty human, but the, yeah, I think so. But I, 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 I think it's history. there's <laughs> yeah, I, I think it's like one of those things where I, I I love reading like the Desert Fathers. I love reading John of the Cross, Teresa of Avila. Like they're so wonderful. And, and in a way they set some really important paradigms for us, but it's you can, you know, you can use their life, even their lives, which are so, so inspiring as an example that kind of takes you away from the nature of the spiritual life too. And there's, there's just that, yeah. And I there's think that like, walking like, on water kind of like, 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 like the, the, like the, the thing that comes out of like the monastic culture that I just think is like absolutely wrong. And that is that like this idea that like that human sexual desire is just wrong period. And that comes out even out of some of the greatest church fathers. Yeah. And that's that's a that's a serious mistake. Well, and that's the other side, and, and I'm I'm more inclined, I but think I, personally. I think, I think you have to remember though that there was no form, there were very few forms of contraception, right? So sex was viewed completely differently than than we view it today in the modern world, in the ancient yeah. world. Well, yeah, and it, absolutely. And all of those, all of those okay. things are totally valid. And I think, I think my tendency, though, like, and this is that ties into somebody's struggles with, you know, the bipolar disorder, and it is, I find sometimes that 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 kind of self righteous mode of asceticism to be so averse that my tendency is to go the other way, right, and just be like, you know, fairly carnal you know right, like I, right and, and which I, is also wrong and, and I, that's and, it, it it's equally unsatisfying and so and that's why I, like i i keep going back and saying like this is the walking on water the living in that on that tent in that right. liminal spot it's christ in that midpoint in between lucifer and ariman yeah and and that's a really straddling you know, the me, space between the two beasts you know for me that's the challenge is like um you know is somebody kind of more probably inclined like the poets than the saints, right? You know, who probably whose life would you know sometimes looks more like a but the church you know, needs a Shelley or a Byron the, right, than a, right. But the church <laughs> needs and, and by the way, I'm not saying I'm not saying there's anything wrong with the monastic lifestyle, right? No, and, and there's I'm not I'm not saying that I'm not saying that holding it up as the highest thing, I don't necessarily agree with. The reality is, is that the church needs poets and it needs and it needs monks. Yeah, yeah, and and the the, the tendency of the poet, the, the vices that the poet is tend tends toward versus the vices that the the monk tends toward, they're different, but they're just inversions of each other, 
you know, where vice and virtue, it's like, unless you're in that midpoint, like you're talking about in between the two poles where the virtue is, 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 is really comes from the connection to the spirit, then it, then the vice can, you know, you, you know, the harmonic vice or the well, it's virtue. Is not virtue. Even, it's not even pursued because it's virtue, right? It's just, <laughs> it is the course of life. It's not, it, it's the fruit that comes from the spirit, right? And that's yeah. a different, that's different than something that you can attain to and manufacture and do on your own. The kind of thing that Sherry's warning against earlier when we're talking, right? That yeah. side of it, you know, it's like, if you think that this is coming from you, as opposed to a seed that was planted within you that is the life of God itself that is producing this, you know, yeah. and, and it's, it, we're just, we're constantly called into this really uncomfortable spot of that liminal space between the upper and the lower at the meeting point of the cross, you know, between the two poles, however you want to put it, like we're kind of stretched in that spot and it's not very comfortable, but I don't know how to, I don't, I don't, you know, I don't have like, you know, I'm not spiritual enough to know how to escape that at this point, as much as it's like, gosh, I just hope I can learn how to navigate that a little better. <laughs> All right. Yeah. No, that's no, Sh Sherry. Yeah, go ahead, Sherry. I was going to say, I was just going to say that I could tell you had something to say. So let's let you have the last word. <laughs> I, I, wanted to, I wanted to read this quote from George MacDonald um, that I just thought was interesting because it's about revelation, right? Um, which is what we're talking about, the apocalypse. So he says here, some people believe so little in a, oh, wait a minute, maybe that's not it. Uh, here we go. Yeah. At all events, if God showed them these things, God showed them what was true. He's talking about the Israelites here. Um, it was a revelation of himself. He will not put on a mask. He puts on a face. He will not speak out of flaming fire if that flaming fire is alien to him, if there is nothing in him for that flaming fire to reveal. Be his children ever so brutish, he will not terrify them with a lie. It was a revelation, but a partial one, a true symbol, not a final vision. No revelation can be other than partial. If for true revelation a man must be told all the truth, then farewell to revelation. Yea, farewell to the sonship. For what revelation other than a partial can the highest spiritual condition receive of the infinite God? But it is not therefore untrue because it is partial. Relatively to a lower condition of the receiver, a more partial revelation might be truer than that would be which constituted a fuller revelation to one in a higher condition. For the former might reveal much to him, the latter might reveal nothing. Only whatever it might reveal, if its, its nature were such as to preclude development and growth, thus chaining the man to its incompleteness, it would be but a false revelation fighting against all the divine laws of human existence. The true revelation rouses the desire to know more by the truth of its incompleteness. That's really good. And I was actually thinking earlier... <laughs> Yeah, I was actually thinking earlier when we were talking about the sea of glass, I was thinking about this tension between like, like the, the two very different notions of, 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 of the, of the eschaton, you have like these sort of like static or repeated static kind of images like that. But then you also have like, you know, uh, like uh, the, the further up and further in uh, kind of like C.S. Lewis slash Gregory of Nyssa. <laughs> <laughs> sort of image and it's like i was just thinking while you're reading that i'm like i'm wondering if it's like almost like if what we have isn't in our in our own being is if we don't oscillate between being between being and eternity and becoming yeah i think like it's like forever a sense of it, like <laughs> it, it, yeah it's the the impassable possibility of our existence and, right? and, and it maybe both are true Oh, like, I think that like, they like have the, to be. The, be the becoming is further up and further in and never ends but at, but at the same time we also we also participate in that, that in that absolute rest in that sabbath yeah and and I think that that's like in terms of you know participating in the divine life is to participate both in the infinite yeah, which like, is yeah, already right, always that's... actualized and in the finite which is always becoming 
And so we have that, 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 I don't know how to explain that well, but I feel like that's that's the foundation of the Which is interesting too, because this suggests that both process, that process theology and classical theology can be both, classical theism can be right at the same time. Yeah, Yeah. I had a, I had a fun talk with Tom Belt on that. We were talking about Bulgakov and, and how there, there is an element of, of the process within Bulgakov's I kept trying thinking. to get, I'm trying to get Tom on here. We got to get Yeah, I will get I him wanna, on, I'm pretty yeah, sure. Yeah, He's such a, he's such a cool guy. Yeah, he is. He's awesome. So. But yeah, I mean, there's, there's no way around, like, and I think maybe some of, some of like the, the whole reason behind that lamb slain from the foundation of the world is that is the mode of experience of finitude that is how theosis is expressed in a finite existence. Yes. But we also have the infinite, which is grounded yes. all, and that is yes. always actualized in everything at all times. And it's kind of that that unchanging, you could say static, but I, I like the I like the um, the terms like the um, Thomas's use of actus purus. It's 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 perfect motion, so it's perfect rest. At I the think same it's time. peace. What can we call? What can we say? Peace and love. What yeah. about the peace that passes all understanding? <laughs> right because the peace is that because the peace is associated with like the the eternal and the infinite i think and and love is more it's in the realm of relation right so but like right, love is, is like is it, it, it involves that the interaction with that with the becoming so i think yeah i think this this is really good guys i'll have to yeah. think more about this this is this i i have to go for now but that that the ending of this conversation we went into I think we went well beyond box text, but uh, <laughs> we're still talking about the end of things, so it's okay. Yeah. yeah. Thank you for joining me today, guys. This was a really great one. This. Yeah. Thanks, Bye, Nate. Bye, Jedediah. Bye, Sherry. Take care. <laughs>